Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Um, we're supposed to be moving into chapter, finishing up chapter 14, moving into chapter 15 this morning. Um, but uh, Glenn came in Monday, I think it was Monday, and we sat down, we were having a, a conversation, and we got on the subject of authority. And then from that, I moved into a review of what we already looked at, and I was looking at the first five verses of Revelation chapter 14, those verses that we'd already covered. I said, man, there's so much more in this. And so I, was, I opened up a couple of commentaries. One of them was um, John Corson's commentary, and it was a, um, a topical study that he did called Purity Pays. So that's what's inspired me to get back into the first five verses of Revelation chapter 14 this morning. In this book, we've seen the well, first five verses, we've seen the 144,000. They're out boldly proclaiming the gospel message. And we first seen them in chapter 7, but now we still see them in chapter 14. Seven chapters later, lots of things have taken place. The, the Antichrist has been on a, on a hunt. He's been trying to take out the Jewish nation as a whole. But we still see 144,000, not 139,999, but 144,000 brightly proclaiming the, the, the gospel of God. They're preaching the gospel. They're shining brightly in this dark, diabolical world. And uh, that's the question I ask you this morning. Are you um, shining brightly? Or have you dimmed out? Have you lost some of that fire? You know, we, that's what, what that song was all about, a soul on fire. You know, bring me back. Make me a soul on a fire. Because we're... Entering into, I say entering, I'm not said we've entered into, because I believe we're still entering into some very, very dark days. But it doesn't have to impact you. It doesn't have to have a bearing on what you're doing. Um, this is where John's people were. John was writing to a group of people who were living in times of persecution, uh, Caesar Dementia was trying to stomp out Christianity. He's trying to wipe out Christianity totally. But these 144,000, that's what John is pointing to. Look at this 144,000 that we're going to see in the last days. Now, we're in the Great Tribulation period, and the Bible tells us we will escape the very hour of the Great Tribulation because the Great Tribulation is God's wrath being poured out. But Jesus also say, in this world, you will have tribulation. We will experience trials and tribulation, not from God's wrath, but from the world. The world will be attacking Christianity. Just as it was in John's day, it will be today. And we can see some evidence of that right now. But in California, they're trying to get rid of worship altogether. Don't sing to God, you know, because they spread this COVID thing. Stop worship. That's what the world wants us to do. Stop worship. And as I was expressing last week, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're, we're moving into, because we can see a culmination of all the things that the Bible's being, been talking about. And you know, people say, well, they've been talking about that for years. But we now see these things unfolding right before our eyes. And the days are going to get even worse. They're going to get darker. I believe America, within the next year, might even be on the brink of starvation. Because the economy is going to crash. I believe it will happen. But we don't have to give in to that. We don't have to be a part of this world. We can be like the 144,000 out boldly proclaiming the gospel message. Now these guys weren't faking it. That's one of the things we've got to understand. They weren't faking it. This is real to them. And there's 144,000 who were protected by God. His mark was upon them. No one could touch them. But here's the question I ask you. As these days get darker, will you be burning brightly or will you be burning out? And the, the, the answer to that question is really dependent upon where your hope is. Where's your hope? 
Is it in this world? Is it pinned in this world? Are you white-knuckling this world, trying to hang on? Or is your hope in heaven? We see two examples in contrast in Scripture. Peter had been following Jesus for three years. He had left everything to follow Jesus. His faith was in Jesus. But for some reason, on the night of the betrayal, when the Roman soldiers came and took Jesus away, when he seen the direction all this was going, he denied the Lord three times, even before a little servant girl. What happened? I think that what happened to Peter is that he simply lost hope. His faith was in Jesus. But you see, his hope was still pinned in this world. You see, he had hopes of Jesus riding in on this white stallion and overthrowing the Romans and setting up his kingdom upon earth. His hope was pinned in this world. So his hope failed him. Now I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys refuse to bow down to the idols of this world. They refuse to be like the people of this world. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you bow down or else I'm going to throw you into that fiery furnace. Send us away. And then as they're in this furnace, the ropes were singed. The ropes broke them free, but there wasn't even a hair on their arm that was singed. They were seen walking around in this fiery furnace, in this fiery trial, if you will. Nebuchadnezzar turns to the servant and says, how many guys did you throw into that furnace? His servant says, three, just like you told me. He says, then why do I see a fourth man in the fire? He's looking like the son of God. So Jesus is in that fire with them. He was in the fire. They refused to bow down to the idols. And they entered into the fire. But yet Jesus was with them. They were burning brightly. They were souls on fire. Their flesh wasn't on fire. Their souls were on fire. They were, they, they were proclaiming the gospel even before Nebuchadnezzar the king who threw them into the fire. We're about to enter into a fire. We're not going to go through the Great Tribulation. We're going to see some bad stuff happen. I believe that in the core of my being. But we can be those who still proclaim the gospel. And that's why I think it's important that we look back upon these five, chapter, or five verses of chapter 14. Let's, let's investigate, let's dissect these 144,000. Let's see what they were about. Why they were still unharmed in the midst of this great tribulation. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, real quickly. And I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Written on their foreheads. That speaks of that which is on the forefront of the mind. Anytime you see the forehead in Scripture, it's speaking of that which is at the forefront of their mind. What was at the forefront of their mind? God. He's what they were focused upon. He was, his word was at the forefront of their mind. What is the forefront of your mind? What is your life about? What are you living for? You see, these guys are on a mission. And the Word of God is at the forefront of their mind. Yeah, what's your life priority? What are you searching for? What are you longing for? What are you hoping for? Where is your hope? In a retirement fund? You know, I'm saving for retirement. But what is my life about? What is your life about? What's the end result that you're looking for? These guys had God's word at the forefront of their mind. God's promises were at the forefront of their mind. God's commandments 
were at the forefront of their minds. He was what they're longing for, searching for. And listen to what Isaiah the prophet wrote. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. He said, The steadfast of mind will keep, you will keep in perfect peace. You see, if you, if God's word, if his word is at the forefront of your mind, if God is on your mind constantly, then you'll be experiencing peace continually. You'll have a peace in your heart. That's what we're longing for, isn't it? Peace. We want peace. Peace in our souls. We want satisfaction for our souls. And they, in the midst of this great tribulation where the entire world is coming up against the nation of Israel, attacking Israel, chasing them down, putting them to death, the 144,000 had God's word at the forefront of their mind. And therefore, in peace, in a peace of mind, they could still go out in the midst of this persecution, in the midst of this tribulation, they still went out proclaiming the gospel of God. They had peace in the midst of this. And you too can have peace in spite of what's happening around us. Be it the coronavirus, be it the Black Lives Matter protesting, be it the pulling down of statues, be it burning of buildings, be it, you know, being out on the interstate, being stopped by this mob, you can still have a perfect peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. If God's word is at the forefront of your mind. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. He says, For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent of what is evil. He, in, innocent of what is evil. That can be translated ignorant of what is evil. You don't understand this evil stuff, because you're not a part of this evil stuff. You don't know this evil stuff. There's an innocence, there's an ignorance when it comes to things that are evil. Do you willingly enter into that which is evil? Flip on the TV. Do you willingly enter in to that program, that TV show? Turn on the radio. The secular music, do you willingly enter in to what's being broadcast over the airways? Do you want a peace that surpasses understanding? Then be willingly ignorant, innocent of those things. Now, it's all around us. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's all around us. But we don't have to willingly engage in that which is evil. You want a peace, God's word at the forefront of your mind. And be willingly ignorant of the things that's around you. We continue on verse 14. It says, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard, because this is a voice that's in unison, I believe this is the 144,000. Listen to what it's being said. Which I heard was like the sound of harpist playing their harps. The 144,000 were speaking with authority. Their voices were thundering. The word was going out in a very powerful and dramatic way. The way the earth was shaking. The earth was quaking because... They had authority because God's word was at the forefront of their mind. They had authority to speak. They had given their lives totally, completely. They were innocent of that which is evil. They had given their hearts over. And they had authority in their voices. You remember Peter. And this is another reason they had such authority. This is another reason in which they can speak with such authority. Peter. You know, he was cowered away. He was in the upper room with 120. You know, they were hiding out. They were scared. They were in fear. And they're praying. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Something dramatic happened to Peter. Why? Because shortly after this, he's out proclaiming the gospel in the midst of all the Pharisees, in the midst of all the religious police, in the midst of the, the angry mob. That, you know, he's up there and he's preaching with, a, with authority, with power. 
And 3,000 souls got saved in his very first sermon. Do you proclaim with authority? How do you proclaim with authority? Jesus, the, 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 the gospel tells us, spoke with such authority. Jesus was set apart from all the other religious rabbis or from all the other scholars. And then they said, where does this man get such authority to speak? Where does it, where, you know, the cre- we're told that the common man the very common man used to hang onto his every word. They were awestruck. Not because he was performing miracles, not because he was healing people, but because of the words he spoke. People just like, whoa, where does he get such gracious words? Where does that authority come from? From the forefront of the mind, that which is the forefront of the mind, that which is in your heart, That's the, that which is in you. You know, the, the, for you people that's... Uh, coming up and teaching. You could get up here and teach. You could study these things out. You could learn, and then you could come up and teach us what you learn. But where does the authority come from? From knowing these words. From getting into them and applying them to our lives. For the, these words becoming the, the, you know, the, that which is at the forefront of your heart and your mind. You know, you could speak, and you could teach, you could preach, but the authority has come from that which is in you. The Word of God was planted in them. That's what they were about. They were not about their jobs. They were not about their careers. They were not about their families. They were about the Word of God. And the Word of God became a part of who they are. Therefore, they had a peace that surpassed all understanding. And they also had authority to proclaim this gospel message in their voice. You know, you could, like I said... You could get up here and you could be a scholar. You could know these scriptures and you could teach these scriptures, but where does the power, where does the spirit come in? It's not just a head knowledge, it's also the heart knowledge. You knowing. The word know, as the Bible declares it, means to have an intimate knowledge of. Remember in 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes, You know what restrains him now. The word know speaks of intimacy. There's three levels of knowing. You've got know, I know who our president is, but I also know, second level of knowledge, I know my friend Charlie. We're in a relationship because I know him. I know the president, first level of knowledge, then I know Charlie, who's my friend. I've been in a relationship, but I have an intimate knowledge because we share our hearts, we share our lives with my wife. I know her intimately. She's a part of who I am. Is God a part of who you are? Are you in an intimate relationship? A lot of people know God. They talk about God. They know of God, but they don't know Him. They know His Word, but they don't know Him. The authority comes from knowing Him. Being in an intimate relationship with him. Continuing on. So they, they had the word of God on their mind. They had the authority in their voices. And then the third thing that we want to identify about this, these guys had a song on their lips. I don't normally teach with notes, so let me get back here. Verse uh, 3, it says, and they sang a new song. A new song. That, 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 when any time you see a new song, that, that phrase in Scripture, it speaks of joy. There was a joy in them. They sang a new song. They were joyful. <laughs> Could you imagine that? They've just gone through, you know, I think probably about five years of hell on earth at this point. There's been war, there's been famine, there's been disease, there's been earthquakes, there's been asteroids hitting the planet. There's been demons rising up out of the pits of hell. And yet, these men, these 144,000, are filled with joy. They're filled with joy. There was a new song on their lips. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000. Because it was a special song. It was an intimate song. 
Jesus, or Paul wrote, you are his workmanship. Speaking to the church at that time, workmanship, the Greek word that's used there is poema. Poema means love song. We're his love song. And he's written, he's writing songs upon our hearts. These are songs of intimacy, kind of like the Song of Solomon. It's the song of intimacy. And there's joy coming forth. There was a song that no one else could sing but the 144,000. Just as there's a song between Tammy and I that no one else can sing because it's an intimate song we have together. It's an intimate knowledge. Do you have a personal and intimate knowledge with Jesus Christ? Or is he just the person you learn about at church? The person you give to on church? The one you sing about? At church, do you have an intimate knowledge of him? Because the trials and the tribulations, the persecutions are coming. Where are you going to be found? You're going to be found with those that's given their, over to the world and the demands of the world? You said, no, my hope is not in this world. My hope is in heaven. Where are you at personally? I'm, I'm challenging you this morning because my desire is that we all go a little deeper. So that we can be a, a brighter body. Speaking of which, this, this song of joy, is it Peter, I'm sorry, the Hebrew writer, I can't remember. Um, he tells us that Jesus was the most joyful person who ever lived. See, that's another reason for that joy that's in them. He was the most joyful person who ever lived. You know, when we look at Scripture, when we, you know, because of our, sometimes our church upbringing, because of the paintings, because of the movies, we get, we get this image in our mind that Jesus was a very sad and somber, serious person. You know, when he spoke, he spoke in a monotone voice. But that's the opposite of what Scripture tells us. He was the happiest person who ever lived. He was a hoot to be around. He was the life of the party. The, the, the prostitutes, the, 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 the thieves, the drunkards, they loved being around him. He was, he was life. They were experiencing life when they were around him. And I think that's one of the things, that the, why the, the 144,000, why they're shining so brightly in the midst of this tribulation. Let me ask this question of you. Do people... The drunkard, the druggie, the, the whore, do they like being around you? Are you a hoot to be around? Or are they running from you? Man, that guy's just too religious for me. He's just, he's just way out there. He's a sandbag. You know, he's bringing me down. No, we, we are to re represent life and life abundantly. Jesus is supposed to be in us. And if we have an intimate knowledge, if we have an intimate relationship from, with him, it should, he should be protruding from us. I'm telling you, people flock to him like children to an ice cream truck on a hot summer day. He was so refreshing. The Pharisees were the religious prudes in that day. They looked down their noses at people. They said, well, how could your rabbi, how could your teacher be eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Let's turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I think the reason Jesus was so happy, because he himself was a song. It says, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 38. It says, in the early morning, while it was still dark... And we're, we're told that Jesus would oftentimes be praying late in the evening. I mean, he was up on this mountaintop praying as his disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee. He wanted to be alone with God the Father. Jesus got up, left the house early in the morning while it was still dark, and went to a secluded place and was praying there. He got up. He wanted to spend some time with Pops with dad. 
So we got to, when, when there's no other distractions and there's no other people, because people were crowding in on him in those days. So he had to break away. He had to get out, they take, capitalize on these opportunities to spend time in prayer. Simon and his companions, I'm sorry, companions searched for him. They couldn't find him. But they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. Because they've been on this mission for three and a half years. You know, and the, 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 they had this, this uh, the, the, their headquarters in Capernaum, which was a beach town. You know, it was like, man, we're in a beach town. And then the crowds were starting to come in. And, and they said, Jesus, man, you're a hit. You're a hit. The people are into you, man. They, they're looking for you. They're all out searching for you. So he's been a big hit in this town of Capernaum. He's set up his, his headquarters there, and, and his ministry has been so effective. He, he's having to slip away in the late evening or in the early morning. He's slipping away just so he could pray. He said to them, verse 38, Let's go, let us go somewhere else, to the towns nearby. So they're in this capital city. This big city, this beach town city, with a very heavily populated area. And the, his disciples are coming to him and saying, Lord, you're a rock star. They're into you. They're searching for you. He said, well, let's go to the towns nearby. Now, the word that's used there, it would be kind of like saying Cowtown, Hickville. You're a hit in St. Louis, Missouri. Jesus is a hit in St. Louis. And you know what he says? Let's go to Hornsville. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why would you go to these little hick towns? Listen to what he says. So that I may preach there also. Listen, let's go to Hickville. Let's go to Hornsville. We've been in St. Louis, major town. People's into us. But let's also go to Hickville and preach there also. For that is what I came for. They've been looking for him. He's been praying to God the Father, right? He's been in this intimate relationship with God. He spent some time with Pops. He's coming out. They find him. Jesus, you're hick. And he says, let's go to Caltown. For that's what I came for. Where do you come from? Think, think of this. That's where, that's why I came out of prayer. You see, he's up early in the morning. His father is at the forefront of his mind, in his heart. He wants to be communing with him. The crowd is saying, let's do this, that, or the other. He says, no, that's not what dad said. That's, that's, I came forth because he wants me to go to these little villages and pro, proclaim the gospel. See, there were no distractions in their lives. The 144,000. They had a mission. They were connected to God. They had authority in their voices. They knew exactly what to do. But see, we're often influenced by what's happening, right? We, you know, what's happening with Black Lives Matter? What's happening with the coronavirus? What's happening here? What's happening, here? What's happening politically? We get distracted. Jesus spent time with the Father. He was connected to the Father. So he, was in, he, he knew what he was to do day by day. He was focused. Psalm 144, verse 15. How blessed. Oh, how happy. That's what blessed means. Oh, how happy. Joyful. Oh, blessed are the people whose God is Lord. Lord. Boss, Boss leader, master. King. Is God your Lord? Is He your master? Or is your flesh your master? Or is your feelings your master? Your emotions your master? Or the alcohol your master? Or the drug your master? What's your master? What's the master passion of your life? You see, depression, despair, fear, anxiety, worries, and concerns, it all comes from where our focus is. If I'm focused on myself, I'm going to withdraw, and I'm going to be a self-absorbed person demanding everybody do something for me or wanting from someone else. 
But if Jesus, if He's my Lord, if He's my master passion, I'm going to be a happy person. I'm going to be the life of the party just as Jesus was. Continuing on. I didn't mean to beat that horse to death, but here we go. <laughs> Verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women. Now, I'm not trying to take away from what this is saying. These men have not been defiled by women. But also remember, John is writing with signs and symbols. The woman could be anything. It could be a religion. It could be a plan or it could be a program. Well, like the adulterous woman in the Proverbs, yes. So these have not been defiled by the women. This, these are the ones who have not been influenced by what's being broadcast in, in, in the media. These are not the ones that's influenced by the, the virus that's going around. These are not the ones that's being influenced because of the riots and the protests. They're not influenced. They're not defiled by all that. Yes, it means what it says. It literally means women. And in our application, it also means anything that's taking our focus off of God. For they have kept themselves chaste. They've kept their mind focused. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Wherever the Lamb goes, that's where I go. Wherever you go, I follow. These are the ones who have not been influenced by the world system. These are the ones who've who are shining brightly. Did you know the sun, in its volume, can contain 1.3 million earths? That's a lot of volume, isn't it? That's a big sun. But yet, just like that clock on the wall, I can blot it out with my thumb. And block it out. It can obstruct my vision of the sun. S-O-N. Where are you at? You know, you got the sun, you got the moon, right? The moon is a reflection. The light you see in the moon is not of itself. It's a reflection of the sun. To the same degree, the earth, the world comes in between the sun and the moon, the more the, the moon's light is going to increase or diminish. See, I can be shining brightly as long as this world and everything that's happening in the world is not getting in the way. To the same degree, my light diminishes to the same degree that the world is coming in between me and the sun, the S-O-N. Are you a half moon, you a full moon, are you a quarter moon, or are you a new moon? There's no light at all. The 144,000 didn't let anything come in between. So they were shining brightly. They were a full reflection of the sun. The S-O-N. Let's jump to verse 5 just for a moment. Then no lie, and again that word, uh, if you get down to the root, the Greek, uh, the word could be translated not just a lie, in which lie is guile, but the, uh, it could mean guile, deception, or it could mean um, guile. What's another word for guile? <laughs> Something that's unholy, unfit, unrighteous, waste, waste, perfect. There was no waste, and no waste was found in their mouth. They are blameless. There was nothing coming out of their mouth that was unfit, that was un unholy. Their speech was a reflection of what was in their hearts. Listen to what uh, Paul wrote in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Pick up verse 3. He says, but immorality or in any 
impurity or greed must not even be named among you. In other words, live your life in such a way that when someone looks at you, they don't see immorality. They don't see greed. But it's a train. For what's in our heart, there's a train. My, 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 my motive, my position is the train. Where my focus is is the train. And out from this train, from the heart, follows many other things. Listen to this. He said that must not be filthiness, silly talk, or coarse jesting, dirty jokes, talking about immoral things of the world, laughing at the immoral things of the world, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks, giving thanks to God for blessing you with life, for blessing you with a home, blessing you with food, always giving thanks. There's another thing, when your focus is off of God, you're going to be wanting, desiring, craving, not appreciative of what you do have, but wanting what you don't have. It's a reversal of the mind. We've got to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. It says, You brood of vipers, how can you... <laughs> He's talking to the Pharisees. In the people's eyes, the Pharisees were the most righteous people of the day. And Jesus is turning to them, You brood of vipers. They, they were the religious people. They, they were the ones people looked up to, held up in a, you know, in a high position. He says, You brood of vipers... How can you, being evil, that would have rocked their world. The disciples, you're calling the Pharisees, these religious people, these righteous people, evil? Being evil, speak what is good. You're evil. How is it possible for you to speak what is good? James talks about this. That which is in you is going to be proceeding from you. For the mouth speaks what feels the heart. Again, we're getting back to the core. What's our motive? What, what are we living for? What are we focused upon? It goes right to the core of our heart. This is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 14. And if he called the crowds to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand what I'm trying to say to you. Listen and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. Did you hear what he said? Nothing. You know what nothing means? You look it up in the Greek. You know what nothing means? Nothing. Nothing. Now, what does that imply? Think, of it, think this through with me. Nothing on the outside can enter into you and defile you. Nothing. Drugs. Alcohol. Nothing you eat, nothing you drink can defile you. That's not permission to become an alcoholic or a drug addict. Listen to what I'm saying here. But nothing on the outside can enter in and defile you. You know why? You're already defiled. <laughs> You're already corrupt. Paul says, the good that I want to do, I don't do. I end up doing the very evil that I hate. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to rescue me? Who's going to save me from this body of death? Jesus Christ. There's nothing on the outside of a man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has, an ear, has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me Listen to what I'm telling you. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Come on, guys. Do you, do you not get this? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside, cannot defile him. Can't do it. Because if it does not go into, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. It goes in, it comes out, he's not defiled. Thus he declared all foods clean. Because they could not eat catfish, rabbit, or pork. I mean, that was a really bad life, wasn't it? 
But they had this really strict religious diet. But all that was pointing to someone, something greater. Jesus, of course. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that, which, that is what defiles the man. That's what's coming out. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornication, thefts, murders, and adulteries. These are what defile a man. Deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. It's not what's going in, it's what's coming out. Because it's what's in the heart. That's what defiles a man, what's in his heart. So what's in my heart? What's directing my life? Is satisfying my flesh directing my life? Well, I'll probably use the drugs. I'll probably drink the alcohol. But it's what's already in you. And you cannot clean your life up through a 12-step program. You can't clean the heart up through a 12-step program. It's a, it's a one-step program. Give your heart to Jesus. He moves in. He changes how you see these things. That's exactly what happened to Peter. His perspective had changed. He realized that it wasn't about this world. His perspective changed. I have nothing to gain from this world. I only have something to gain from heaven where Jesus is. His perspective changed. You change the perspective of the... By, you invite Jesus in. He changes your perspective. He changes how you view the substances, this world, people, women, whatever the case may be. He changes your perspective. Consider it all joy, my brother. When you encounter various trials and tribulations, hard times, consider it joy. How is that possible? Jesus in your heart. He changes our perspective. He changes how I see things. A lot of people say prayer changes things. That's not entirely true. Prayer can change things. It's not prayer that changes things. It's faith that changes things. It doesn't change things, actually. It doesn't change your circumstances. It changes how you view those circumstances, how you view what's happening in the world. It all boils down, again, to the hope that is in you. Finally, let's look at uh, verse 6, and we'll wrap this up. And I actually had in my mind, well, this is probably about a half hour. We'll wrap it up at 11 o'clock. Sorry, but we are wrapping it up now. Going back to verse uh, 14, the second half of verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 4. These have been purchased. These have been purchased. My life's been purchased. You know what that means? It's no longer my life. I've been purchased. I've been redeemed. I've been taken out of this world. My focus is not to be on this world. I've been purchased from among men. I'm not like those that's in this world. I've got to change how I think. And Paul says, take every thought captive. Take every thought captive and pray without ceasing. Don't, you know, we have a flesh, my feelings, my emotions, my, my, the, the anger sometimes, it's usually trying to direct my life. I've got to capture that. I've got to get hold of it. And then I turn to God in prayer because he's redeemed me. I belong to him. I don't belong to my flesh any longer. From among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. We're to be the first fruits. Fruits. Fruit. I'm saying fruits here because it's plural because we're talking about 144,000. But the fruit of God. What is the fruit of God? Fruit. Love. Recognizing the love of God. He so loved me. He came into this world and he purchased me. I belong to him. I now belong to love. Love owns me. Love has purchased me. Love has redeemed me. What follows love? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I've got control because love has redeemed me. Love has purchased me. 
So John's writing to these people, and he's saying, choose, in the midst of all this, choose holiness, choose sanctification, choose purity, set yourself apart, be sanctified. And he said, let the Lord be at the forefront of your mind, and there'll be authority in your voice, a song of joy on your lips. The Lamb will be in your sight, following after him, and there'll be sweetness, goodness coming from your mouth. And the fruit of God will be up on your life. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the study. I pray that it's been heard. I pray that everyone has an ear to hear and that your word has been heard and applied. Lord, we don't need anything else. All we need is you. All we need is you and your love for us, recognizing that, receiving your love into our hearts, May you be at the forefront of our minds. May a song of joy be upon our lips. May we follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we know that even in the midst of trial and tribulation, that you are good, that we, you have something greater for us. So may we be focused upon your kingdom and your righteousness. And may all that we want and desire follow after. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's all sing this last song together.